Well, in other world news, excessive drinking, cleaners and security staff being mistreated, as well as widespread disregard for COVID rules. Just some of the details highlighted by senior British civil servant Sue Gray in her report into illegal lockdown parties at Downing Street. Prime Minister Boris Johnson says he's humbled and bearing responsibility, but is going nowhere. Well, to discuss this and more, I'm joined for Perspective by Duncan Fairgrieve, Professor of Comparative Law at the University of Paris Dauphine and also a practising barrister here in Paris and also in London. So, Duncan, the long wait is over. What happens next? We're told that senior leadership will be bearing responsibility, but will they? And what does that mean? That's a good question. Um, I, in, in a sense, We've already had the um, highlights of this report early in the year with the interim report from Sue Gray. So what, what happened yesterday, in a sense, was to spell out in excruciating detail the exact goings-on uh, at Number 10 during that period. Um, and uh, clearly that th those details about the events, about the gatherings, etc., cetera, are uh, to a certain extent pretty shocking, really. Um, but... Um, I think the Prime Minister has decided that he can brazen this out. Uh, he did apologise just again in, in Parliament. Uh, he said he'd take responsibility, etc. But I think uh, probably he's hoping that this is the last instalment and that there will be a drawing of the line under this. So as to the concrete consequences, um, we, uh, it may well be that he's hoping that is it. But we are talking about law breaking at the heart of the British government here. So is an apology enough in this case? We've had several apologies from Boris Johnson at this point. Again, he's hoping that the line will be drawn under this scandal now. But like, what can possibly be done? Nobody can force him to resign other than his Conservative colleagues. Yeah, that's, that, that's correct. I'm, I think, first of all, the first point is um, reputational. Um, so his personal reputation, I think, um, both in the Conservative Party uh, but obviously in the wider public as well, has, has taken, again, a, a knock. Um, I think also, though, actually, this has a broader impact on the workings of central government as well. And uh, when one looks at the, reads carefully the Sue Gray report, there are lots of um, there are criticisms about the, the culture in Number 10, the way in which uh, the, 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 the senior leadership acted the, and how that was um, perceived by junior juniors, who I think to a certain extent assumed that they had a, a, a more sort of green light for this sort of behaviour. Um, so that needs, to be, that needs to be dealt with. And I think probably the Prime Minister, part of the Prime Minister's argument would be that he has changed quite a lot of the personnel since then, which is true. Um, there has been a, a change in, in, at a senior level. But that does, I think, there will be a broader reflection uh, now on how, um, how, this, how, how, this, how the management actually occurs at senior levels. Um, as to the position of the Prime Minister, uh, the big question is whether this actually changes anything in terms of the determination of Conservative MPs, because, as you said, uh, it is only really Conservative MPs by signing letters, sending them, in, them into the uh, backbench, the 1922 committee, that that could trigger a confidence vote. And I, I think the signs are, uh, although there have been one or two changes, um, overnight, it certainly hasn't been enough, I think, to, to, to gain the required numbers of letters and to go through that process of, um, uh, of vote. Um, and, and to be honest, I don't think there's a, very, a clear um, uh, alternative leader in the Conservative Party as well, which I think is sort of a form of protection <laughs> for the Prime Minister as well, because there's not an obvious choice. Uh, Ricky Sunak, as we know, uh, was, um, has received a fine as well. So he's, I think his um, uh, support for him has maybe reduced. So that may well be uh, enough to allow him to just to, to, to brazen it out. And Duncan, you're talking about reputational damage to the Prime Minister himself, the Conservative Party. What about the wider picture here? How damaging is this for British government more generally and to British institutions, just the fact that there was this law-breaking at the heart of government? No, absolutely. I do think it is, um, it, it is clearly problematic. I mean, the goings-on that have been revealed by the Grey Report would be surprising in, in any circumstances. Partying, fighting apparently occurred at some stage, etc. So um, 
that, that, that would have been surprising in, in any circumstance. But of course, this was during lockdown at a stage when um, the general public were, were fully uh, at, at home. So um, the, the, the signals this send are pretty disastrous to the wider public um, in the sense that those who are setting the setting the legislation were not following them. And not only were they not following them, that there's a whole lot of very revealing correspondence which has been um, published as well, where there was almost a recognition that what they were doing, uh, that, that some of the higher levels were recognition what the, the, they were doing was wrong and that they were getting away with it and, uh, and, and that sort of thing. So that, that sort of level of cynicism at a high level of government, of course, is very damaging. What about though, the Metropolitan Police? Questions are also being raised about how all of this was handled by police. Are there consistence, inconsistencies in the way that they're making decisions about who, or sh who should not be fined and perhaps a difference between these parties and how the general public were treated, were handed out you know, fines, on-the-spot fines, if they were breaching COVID rules? What kind of questions do you think there are there for the police? No, I think, I mean, this, it certainly has also um, um, put into perspective and put under the, the, the uh, spotlight the approach to the police. They had to reopen their, their um, inquiry. And then we, uh, since that period, we've had hundreds of fines that have been meted out. So the, the, the clear is a question at that early stage as to the approach of the police, the, the Met in relation to these um, activities. Um, they've now undertaken the, um, the inquiry. Um, we, um, we, we know that senior figures have received fines um, and many, many other um, advisers and civil servants as well. So um, they have undertaken their work. But again, I think... Um, uh, the, the, there are a whole host of um, institutions that have come out of this, um, of this scandal uh, with their damage um, um, affected. Will there be longer term consequences for them, for some of those institutions? And is this finally the end of, of uh, par the Partygate scandal? Um, Boris Johnson, he's again on the front pages of the newspapers today. But is this all going to go away? Is the public, the British public, going to forget now and move on as Boris Johnson is urging them to do? Well, of course, the Prime Minister hopes that's going to be the case. And we saw, obviously, today with the, um, uh, with the statements going to be made about um, uh, the, uh, a potential windfall tax, response to the um, cost of living crisis, etc., the um, increase in energy bills. So there's a sort of attempt by uh, the government, obviously, to move the, the agenda onwards. Um, however, there is an uh, inquiry being undertaken by the, the Commons Privileges Committee in relation to the, um, uh, not actually the party gate scandal itself, but into the statements made by the Prime Minister in relation to that in Parliament as to whether Parliament was misled by the, the, the Prime Minister. And so from that sense, there will be a, you know, that process is ongoing um, and we will, uh, we will follow that and there will be results of that inquiry. I think it's going to be very, um, it's quite a high bar uh, in terms of what needs to be proven, which is that there's a deliberate or stroke knowing breach of, of, of the um, uh, or mis misleading by the Prime Minister. And we saw yesterday in the, in the Commons, the Prime Ministers were setting out his defence on that, saying that he thought these were work-related events. Um, that was his genuine belief. And that uh, the, uh, the other activities occurred after he had left these events. So he's setting out his stall, I think, in terms of his defence to the Privileges Committee. And we'll see how, how that transpires over the next few weeks. Great, Duncan. Thank you so much for joining us in studio. We'll have to leave it there. That's Duncan Fairgreave, Professor of Comparative Law at the University of Paris, Dauphine, and also practising barrister here in Paris and also in London. Time now for another look at the top stories.